Welcome to a Programming Languages virtual meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in this video, we're going to be covering chapter 5.3 of the structure and interpretation of computer programs. Taking a look at the table of contents for this chapter, the chapter is titled Storage Allocation and Garbage Collection, and there are only two subsections, 5.3.1, Memory as Vectors, and 5.3.2, Maintaining the Illusion of Infinite Memory. And if you take a look at the page count, you will note that this is a shorter chapter. In fact, it is tied with the shortest chapter at 18 pages with uh, chapter 4.2. So this will be a shorter video. Taking a look at the start of the chapter, the chapter reads, in section 5.4, which will be the next section, we will show how to implement a scheme evaluator as a register machine. In order to simplify the discussion, we will assume that our register machines can be equipped with a list structured memory in which the basic operations for manipulating list structured data are primitive. Postulating the existence of such a memory is a useful abstraction when one is focusing on the mechanisms of control in a scheme interpreter, but this does not reflect a realistic view of the actual primitive data operations of contemporary computers. To obtain a more complete picture of how a LISP system operates, we must investigate how LISP structures can be represented in a way that is compatible with conventional computer memories. So that is what this chapter section is going to cover. And uh, a little bit further on in the next paragraph, uh, the textbook reads, List, Lisp systems thus provide an automatic storage allocation facility to support the illusion of an infinite memory. When a data object is no longer needed, the memory allocated to it is automatically recycled and used to construct new data objects. There are various techniques for providing such automatic storage collection. The method we shall discuss in, discuss in this section is called garbage collection. So, uh, for any of you that are you know, programming in school or uh, for your jobs, you'll probably be familiar with GC or garbage collection. Um, the, la the language that I primarily, primarily code in day to day is C++. We do not have garbage collection, but other languages like Python and Java definitely do. So we jump into the first subsection 5.3.1, memory as vectors. So the text reads, representing Lisp data. We can use vectors to implement the basic pair structures required for a Lisp structured memory. Let us imagine that computer memory is divided into two vectors, the cars and the cutters. We will represent Lisp structures as follows. A pointer to a pair is an index into the two vectors. The car of the pair is the entry in the cars with the designated index, and the cutter of the pair is the entry in the cutters with the designated index. So the textbook goes on to uh, provide an example of a list of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. You can see the 1 and 2 are in a sublist and 3 or 4 are just in the top list. And uh, it shows in a visualization in figure 5.14, which we're looking at right now, how this would be stored in the cars and cutters vectors that were just mentioned. So this uh, diagram is a little bit confusing at first until you realize the pattern of how this is represented. So we have a box and pointer diagram which was introduced all the way back in chapter one, so you should be familiar with those. Um, and if we highlight using colors um, how the uh, sort of uh, two rows uh, and values which correspond to each index map to the box and pointer diagram, it actually becomes pretty straightforward. Um, before we do that, though, I should clarify that in the textbook, it mentions that we have uh, P, N, and E, which are the prefi prefixes of sort of the data that's stored in these vectors. P stands for pointer, N stands for number, and E stands for empty list. Uh, so if we go ahead with these sort of color coding, you'll see that uh, the box and pointer uh, that is highlighted with red corresponds to index 7. Uh, the orange one corresponds to index 5. Uh, the green one corresponds to index 4. The blue one to index 2. And then the purple one to index 1. And you can see actually that this is explicitly stated in the sort of enhanced box and pointer diagram in the bottom left of each of these sort of box and pointer uh, pairs. We've got 1, 2, 4, 5, and 7. So these are the index indices. And uh, basically, the first row, the cars, is the car of the box and pointer, each of the box and pointers. And then the cutter is just the cutter. Um, so you can see when we take a look at red, uh, in the cutter is the value 2. So we have N2, N for number. And then in, or sorry, that's the car. And then in the cutter, we just have uh, a sort of the null um, end of list, which is represented by E0. Um, and if you sort of walk through each of the box and pointers for this full diagram, you'll see that it pretty clearly maps to. So purple doesn't store any uh, values, so there's no ends. It's just a car with a, a pointer to um, sort of index five, and then um, the cutter with a pointer to uh, index two, um, which is why we have P5 and P2. So pretty straightforward once you understand the mapping. 
And uh, this takes us to our first exercise, which is basically constructing one of these diagrams. So exercise 5.20 uh, asks us draw the box and pointer representation of the memory vector representation as in figure 5.14, which we just looked at, of the list structure produced by uh, define x to be cons of 1 and 2, and then define y to be list of x and x. Um, so this is pretty straightforward if you've understood the previous uh, figure. Um, first, we'll start with defining x, which is just the cons of 1 and 2. So uh, the define x cons of 1 and 2 is just going to have uh, two numbers, 1 and 2, each in the car and the cutter. So uh, the car, the cars and cutters vectors will look like this. We're storing it in sort of index 3 just because it's not clear the order um, that these should be stored in. But um, we're going to define y in a second, which uses x. Um, so that's why we're putting it in index 3. And if we add uh, define y to be the list of x and x, we'll end up with the following. So uh, the first uh, car cutter pair of list x is basically going to have a car pointing at uh, the value um, of the car uh, of our x, which is going to be at index 3. Um, so we should see p3, and then the cutter of our, our uh, first box and pointer is going to be uh, pointing at uh, the second x um, car cutter pair here, which is going to be at index 2. So we have p3 and p2. And then for the second car cutter pair in our um, list x, we're going to have once again the car pointing at sort of the start of x, well, which is going to be p3 again. And then because this is the end of our list, we're going to have uh, the sort of null e0. Uh, so if we once again sort of color highlight these to make it a little bit more clear, um, red is the x and then green and blue represent um, our list Y. So there's a bit of debate on the sort of SICP solution site as to the exact order of these, um, but I'm not really going to cover that here. I think the important part is that you understand sort of uh, when there's a P, when there's an N, when there's an E0, and you know how to map this box and pointer, which um, regardless of order uh, should make sense at this point. This takes us to our next and final exercise, exercise 5.21, which asks us to implement register machines for the following procedures. Assume that the list structure memory operations are available as machine primitives. Uh, so we're only going to do question A from exercise 5.21, which is to implement a register machine for a recursive count leaves procedure. So uh, pretty simply, this uh, procedure here, count leaves, just takes a tree, which is just a, a, a list or nested list. and um, it's asking us to count the number of leaves in it, which are just going to be the number of values that are in our nested list. So uh, whenever we're at a null tree, we're just uh, returning the value 0. If we're at a pair, um, then we return the value 1. Or sorry, not at a pair. We're at the, we return the value 1 because that's when we've hit a leaf. And then otherwise, we're recursing uh, down the left side and the right side using the car and cutter. So pretty straightforward. Um, let's take a look at the solution, which is a modified version of one of the solutions on the SICP solution site. Uh, obviously, it's quite large, so we're not going to walk through this line by line, but I will give a high-level overview of what this uh, code is doing, and I highly encourage you to walk through. Um, all you need to do is basically plug this code in to the uh, code that you built up from the previous chapter, 5.2. Um, note that you need to uh, explicitly state your registers depending on uh, the make machine procedure that you're using. Uh, so. There was a exercise in the previous chapter that you could basically implicitly infer those, which was what the original solution that I um, am using did, but I am using the one where you have to explicitly state them. So you can see here there's four registers, continue, val, tree, and var, and we'll talk a bit about what those do, but first off, um, Let's highlight the labels, the go-tos, and the branches. So there are five labels in this solution, tree loop, left tree, right tree, after tree, and null tree. Um, there is a go-to statement that corresponds to each one of these labels, um, or sort of the label blocks. Um, so note that two of these are going to labels, the tree loop label, which is sort of our main label, and then the other three go-tos are going to whatever is at the um, uh, or what is ever is whatever is currently stored in the continue register. So that's basically always um, storing a label. Um, so note that you can see right at the beginning we're assigning to continue um, the label uh, count leaves done, which seems a little counterintuitive, like we wouldn't want to be done right away, but that's because this is pretty quickly going to get saved, so i.e. Uh, thrown on the stack, and then uh, we're going to keep on building up as we recurse down, and then once we're done sort of recursing our tree, uh, we'll be left with the go-to um, sort of uh, count leaves done, and then we'll be done our procedure. Um, so on top of the uh, five labels and five go-tos, we also have two branches which correspond to the sort of branching down the left and right um, uh, uh, nodes in our tree. 
uh, which corresponded to the car encoder that we saw in the previous um, uh, racket or uh, scheme procedure. Um, so uh, I've already sort of mentioned that the, the main piece of this is sort of the tree loop. And at the end of our uh, left tree and right tree, we are going back to our tree loop. Um, the key points to sort of understand is that uh, these sort of the first three labels control the the flow of uh, how this uh, mach register machine works. And then after tree uh, takes care of basically um, adding up all of the leafs or the leaf count that we've seen so far. So the var register is used as a temporary. Um, so we're basically putting either a one or a zero, depending on whether we're at a leaf or um, at a node. Um, and then this will get thrown into var. Uh, then we're going to restore val, which is going to get us our, our sort of running total of the number of leaves that we've seen so far, and then we're going to reassign to Val um, uh, the the summation of the temporary var register and the uh, running total in the Val register. And so once we sort of walk through this completely and, and recurse the whole tree, uh, your result is going to be stored in the Val register. Um, so if you uh, if you go to the GitHub page, I have an uh, an example that shows you with a, a tree of seven nodes. That sure enough, if you uh, test this and then check what is in the val register, uh, the answer is seven. So uh, pretty cool. And like I said, I encourage you to walk through this fully. And even if you've been doing the exercise, uh, you know, plug this solution in or code your solution up to test that this actually works. That wraps up the first subsection, memory as vectors. And this takes us to the final subsection, 5.3.2, maintaining the illusion of infinite memory. So. We're going to go through this one um, without sort of looking at the implementation details. The last four to five pages of this chapter section um, or subsection look at uh, the implementation, which is a bunch of code, but there are no ass assignments or exercises that correspond to this. Um, so instead of uh, looking at that code, we're going to look at uh, sort of the interesting pieces from this subsection, which are mostly in the footnotes, uh, which which are pretty interesting. And and sort of the 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 main summary of this subsection uh, is that uh, we maintain the illusion of infinite memory by using uh, garbage collection or some adjacent um, language facility. The first thing that I wanted to highlight was footnote number 13, which comes off of the following sentence, which reads, with a real computer, we will eventually run out of free space in which to construct new pairs. And footnote number 13 states, this may not be true eventually, because memories may get large enough so that it would be impossible to run out of free memory in the lifetime of the computer. For example, there are about three times 10 to the 13 microseconds in a year. So if we were to cons once per microsecond, we would need about 10 to the 15 cells of memory to build a machine that could operate for 30 years without running out of memory. That much memory seems absurdly large by today's standards, but it is not physically impossible. On the other hand, processors are getting faster and, the future, and a future computer may have large numbers of processors operating in parallel on a single memory, so it may be possible to use up memory much faster than we have postulated. So I found this kind of cool going back uh, in time to either 1986 or uh, sometime in the 90s, depending on when this footnote was published with the first edition or the second edition. But regardless of it being the 80s or the 90s, it was definitely over two decades ago as of this recording on uh, January 3rd, 2021. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to say what they th how many bytes they thought um a uh, a cell would consist of, but if you assume it's you know four four bytes, you know so it could store uh, an int thirty two, um, ten to the fifteen uh, times four bytes is equal to either four thousand terabytes or four petabytes of memory, um, which definitely I do not have on my machine right now. Um, and they were definitely correct with uh, their sort of ladder uh, postulation, which is that. Um, you know, most machines these days have uh, multiple cores. I mean, my workstation has 12, and I believe I have 48 gigs of memory. So uh, we definitely not have we definitely have not hit the four petab petabytes of uh, RAM, um, but we have um, hit you know multiple cores. So uh, I hope that we get to the point where we have um, four uh, petabytes of of RAM, uh, and you know maybe in my lifetime that will happen. Um, but yeah, just interesting to sort of go back in time and and. Uh, see, you know, Sussman and Abelson trying to look into the future of what will happen. 
The next thing I wanted to highlight was the following, where the text reads, uh, There are many ways to perform garbage collection. The method we shall examine here is called stop and copy. The basic idea is to divide memory into two halves, working memory and free memory. When cons constructs pairs, it allocates these in working memory. When working memory is full, we perform garbage collection by locating all the useful pairs in working memory and copying these into consecutive locations in free memory. The useful pairs are located by tracing all the car and cutter pointers, starting with the machine registers. Since we do not copy the garbage, there will presumably be additional free memory that we can use to allocate new pairs. In addition, nothing in the working memory is needed since all the useful pairs in it have been copied. Thus, if we interchange the roles of working memory and free memory, we can continue processing new pairs will be allocated in the new working memory, which was the old free memory. When this is full, we can copy the useful pairs into the new free memory, which was the old working memory. So we'll look at a visualization of this um, after we take a look at footnote 15, which is actually the more interesting um, part of this sort of paragraph. So footnote 15 is very long, but I'm going to read through it because I think it's uh, it's pretty cool to uh, at least, you know, skip back to 1986 um, and see where the, the state of the art of uh, garbage collection uh, techniques was at that point in time. So the footnote reads, this idea was invented and first implemented by Minsky as a part of the implementation of LISP for the PDP-1 at the MIT Research Laboratory for Electronics. It was further developed by... Uh, Finishal and Jokelson, um, I apologize if I uh, pronounce those incorrectly, for use in the LISP implementation for the Multix time sharing system. Later, Baker in 1978 developed a real time version of the method which does not require the computation of. Uh, to stop during garbage collection. Baker's idea was extended by Hewitt, Lieberman, and Moon, uh, see uh, the paper in 1983, to take advantage of the fact that some structure is more volatile and other structure is more permanent. An alternative commonly used garbage collection technique is the mark sweep method. This consists of tracing all the structures uh, accessible from the machine registers and marking each pair we reach. We then scan all of memory and any location that is unmarked is swept up as garbage and made available for reuse. A full discussion of the mark sweep method can be found in Allen 1978. And last but not least, the Minsky uh, Finishal Jokelson algorithm is the dominant algorithm in use for large memory systems because it examines only the useful part of memory. This is in contrast to mark sweep, in which the sweep phase must check all of memory. A second advantage of uh, stop and copy is that it is it is a compacting garbage collect collector. That is, at the end of the garbage collection phase, the useful data will have been moved to consecutive memory locations with all garbage pairs compressed out. This can be an extremely important performance consideration machines with virtual memory, memory in which accesses to widely separated memory addresses may require extra paging operations. So I, uh, due to the fact that I don't work in Java and don't know a lot about garbage collectors, um, don't know what the state of the art is, but I think it's really cool to sort of look back at sort of the evolution up until whatever, 1986 or the mid 1990s um, of, you know, sort of the mark and sweep idea and uh, compacting garbage collectors versus non-compacting garbage collectors. Um, yeah, I thought this was honestly one of the most interesting parts of chapter 5.3. And last but not least, uh, this is the visualization of the description of um, sort of the two free and working memory um, garbage collector uh, scheme. So this is sort of split into sort of two halves. You can sort of imagine a vertical or horizontal line here. We start off with um, sort of uh, free memory. So this is the unused memory and then a mixture of useful data and garbage. And then after we have done our garbage collection, uh, where our data used to be is now discarded memory. So AKA uh, will be reused in the future and um, now we have all of our useful data you know partitioned to the front and now free memory uh, with the garbage having been sort of uh, deleted and uh, this is I think uh, a lot more clearer to understand than reading that paragraph and I believe um, the last thing I want to note is just this really funny footnote of uh, footnote number 17 which states the term broken heart was coined by David Cressy who wrote a garbage collector for MDL a dialect of Lisp developed at MIT during the early 1970s. So um, I, I haven't covered the part of the chapter that mentions it, but basically when you're moving uh, data from one partition sort of to the front uh, of the other free memory, which is going to end up being the partitioned useful data, whenever you leave behind sort of the data um, that's been moved from, they call this like uh, they mark it as broken heart so that you know that um, this data has already been copied. And if you need to copy it again in the future, you don't end up copying it. You just do sort of pointer uh, pointer reassignment uh, to point to the correct place. So I thought it was neat that um, uh, in, in the MIT lecture uh, by, I believe, uh, Sussman and Abelson, they mentioned that um, David Cressy was a romantic, which is why um, he uh, termed it broken heart. 
And with that, the last thing I want to mention is just uh, the MIT lecture that I just mentioned. Um, I highly recommend, once again, similar to uh, the lectures that corresponded to 5.1 and 5.2, uh, these lectures are way better than the text, um, way more interesting to watch than it is to read uh, these chapter sections, at least for chapter five. Uh, at least that's what I found. Um, they cover the, basically the same stuff that I've covered in more detail and uh, probably did a better job of explaining it. Um, and at the end of this lecture, because it's 10B, it actually corresponds to the last lecture of the course that they're giving because I believe this uh, lecture was given um, next to the first edition of the book and they've rearranged the order of chapter five. Um, so because this was the last lecture, uh, uh, Sussman ended with, Dr. Sussman ended with uh, basically uh, explaining the halting problem. <laughs> so that's how he halted the course. And then very funnily, one of the students in the class um, asked, is, uh, asked a question about the halting problem and then after that followed up with, um, is that the last question? And then there was like a 20 second pause and in the comments of the YouTube video, uh, someone wrote, um, uh, is this the last question? Uh, that 20 second stare into the camera with the final answer, apparently so, is the nerdiest thing I've seen on this channel. Uh, I love it. And yes, it was very entertaining um, to see sort of a, a uh, in-person demonstration of the halting problem. And uh, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. We've got two chapter sections left, 5.4 and 5.5. So I hope to see you in the next video.